All right, now for something different. We're gonna get into what is called electric potential, kind of starting to focus more on the energy arguments around charges and how we can make charges respond to one another and move around. Uh, so very similar how in physics one, we kind of do the force arguments, which then might go into energy arguments, uh, like with kinetic energy, potential energy, all that sort. We're gonna now kind of go in that direction as well, but now, having a little bit more sophistication compared to intro physics one, we can say something, we can start to think a little bit more deeply about potential energy and what kind of comes together when you, say, when you talk about, say, a ball's potential energy when I drop it in the gravitational field of the Earth. There's an interaction there. There's the ball, and then there's the Earth, and they're responding to each other. And in this case, the ball falls since you know, technically the earth moves a little bit as well, but it is so big it doesn't really move. So the ball is responding to a force given, you know, from the earth on the ball. Uh, and then the potential, there's a, we assign this thing called potential energy that could connect to quantities we may be interested in, like kinetic energy, stuff like that. So for the previous class, you kind of reviewed a handful of videos from the intro, my intro sequence course let me summarize again kind of what I think are the big conceptual ideas here around energies, work, potential energy, that sort of stuff. Well, introducing perhaps a little bit more sophistication to some of the ideas that might be helpful for us as we lead on to potential. So again, kind of the big motivation is around an, you know, the idea of conservation, that conservation laws are swell might not be how I would write it in a textbook, but conservation laws are great if you can identify the right quantities. Okay, so if you know what quantities are conserved. It all comes down to definitions. The right definitions can lead to quantities that may be, when I take, say, a time derivative, might be zero, which would then mean they don't change with time. You know, these invariants then lead us to a better understanding of, say, what we think are the fundamental underpinnings of how nature works. It does seem like we can understand more or less all of nature as just a set of conservation laws where certain quantities, you know, maybe we call it momentum or we call it energy or we call it charge, seem to be conserved uh, and are just kind of passed on from object to object. That then can get back to things which I think are less fundamental, like forces, which might seem weird to hear, right? You know, I don't think forces really are the fundamental thing. Fundamentals ar fun forces arise because of an interaction between two objects. But during that interaction, quantities might be passed from one object to the other in a way that they are conserved, like momentum, angular momentum, energy, that sort of thing. As long as you have the right definitions and as long as you're keeping track of all the interactions that are going on. So these quantities, uh, you know, the important thing is to understand what the quantities are and then understand how the quantities change. So for example, momentum, maybe we use lowercase p, um, right, we defined it as an m times v in intro physics. There's a more general definition of momentum uh, that allows you to also talk about, say, the momentum of a massless particle like a photon, uh, which has an m equal to zero, no mass, but nonetheless has momentum. All in all, though, we can connect these, we can connect momentum to forces uh, by what is really Newton's second law. Um, you know, Newton didn't write F equals MA, but wrote essentially something that said that the momentum of an object changes with time, which is just a fancy way of saying derivative, and called that a force. Or rather, forces cause the momentum of the object to change. This, and then of course, when mass is a constant, the derivative on the left is right, the derivative of mass times velocity. But if mass is a constant, it's just mass times the derivative of velocity, which is acceleration. But this, I think, again, if we're trying to get more into the habit of what's the story a calculus equation is telling us 
dp dt uh, equals to f then says if I treat the if I treat the derivative like a fraction a little bit of change in momentum divided by a little bit of change in time I can then write this as dp equals force dt now any mathematician watching has already shut this off in protest of treat uh, you know the way in physics we treat derivatives like you can treat you know we treat them like uh, you can treat them like an object a derivative or you can treat them kind of like a fraction um, you do have to be a little bit more careful and the mathematicians have taken care to do all that work and essentially in nature more than almost essentially all the time it is okay if we treat the derivative like a fraction in these sorts of cases but you do have to think about these things um, so while I will proceed to continue being a sloppy physicist, uh, nonetheless, there is mathematical arguments justifying what I'm doing. But all in all, what does this say? What is the statement uh, that this says? This says that you know, ch a change in momentum is from forces being applied over time. So I'll say forces applied over time. And again, if I go, if I think of how does that sentence translate to the math equation, changes in momentum, the dp, is from forces, which is from the f, and then it is applied over time, which is the dt. Momentum changes because of forces applied over time. That then allows me to say, if I take the dp equals f dt, I can then consider what happens over long periods of time by just adding up all of these small changes. Well, that's just a fancy word for integrate. Or rather, integrate is a fancy word for saying add up all the small changes. And so the left-hand side of this expression, the integral of dp, right, I'm integrating over changes in momentum, and I'm just adding up a bunch of small changes in momentum, right? In a math course, right, if I said the integral of dx, you would just say the answer is x, right, maybe plus a constant. Um, yeah, let's make this a definite integral so I don't have to deal with constants of integration. All right, so this is from some general start uh, to some general end. And I'll be using start and end a lot, so maybe I will uh, just use S and E. Right, it's the idea of starting and end. The left integral is an integral over momentum, so it'd be some starting momentum and some ending momentum. The right integral is an integral over time, so the limits of integration would be some start time and some end time. But then again, the left integral if this were a math course, and I said you know, integrate dx from you know, x equals a to x equals b, right? you would just say the integral is x, evaluate it at the endpoints, and you subtract the two. That seems like a, a difference, right? It would be the x value at the end minus the x value at the beginning. So similarly, this left-hand integral is just delta p, right? p final minus p initial. And then that seems to be equal to some expression that I can't really do the integral unless you tell me f, um, f dt. Um, and again, from some start to some end. So again, saying the bulk change of momentum occurs when forces are applied over time. And this could be over you know, infinitesimally you know, nearby moments in time. This could be spread over years you know, if we wanted to. But that tells us how momentum changes. Similarly, angular momentum is the same thing. I'll just jump to the end. Um, yeah, angular momentum can be defined as that the change in angular momentum is equal to torques. We're not going to really need this, but so I won't define my, my symbols. But again, the change in angular momentum is equal to torque. Or, repeat the steps we just did for momentum. The bulk change in angular momentum looks like it occurs because of torques applied over time. 
from some start to end. So again, how do you change an object's angular momentum? You apply a torque over some over some expanse of time, which could be again an impulse. You know, you just smack the thing, or it could be you know, you know a, a constant force field, you know, like dropping a ball in a constant force field, versus slapping a baseball with a with a bat. All right. So this integral you might remember, uh, sometimes called the impulse, uh, but again, that's a little. It can be confusing because impulse, you think something that's really fat, you know, really short, uh, you know, a large force over a short amount of time. And this integral, of course, captures that. Uh, but this integral also can capture, you know, a, a, a general constant force, you know, experienced over long periods of time. Anyway. So the momentums are nice because they are very general. Uh, there's essentially one way to write them down. Uh, and then one way to write down how they change. You know, forces applied over time or torques applied over time. Energy, or I don't say energies, uh, um, are nice in that they are scalars instead. Notice momentum and angular momentum are vectors. Energies are nice in that they seem to be scalars. We don't have to worry about direction, just magnitude. Um, but they come in multiple flavors. I'll say multiple forms. You know, kinetic energy, of course, being the one of primary interest, usually. Which is defined to be 1 half m. You might know it as one half mv squared, but again, v, the velocity is a vector quantity. The magnitude of the, of the vector um, is technically defined. So this is where I'll bring in a little bit of upper level stuff. The magnitude of a vector is can be defined as the square root of its dot product with itself. So one half mv squared, we could define, right? You know, technically it's the magnitude of the velocity squared which we could define to be 1 half m, the vector v dotted with itself. And again, just think of the dot product, right? It's the magnitude of the left vector times the magnitude of the right vector. There's v squared times the cosine of the angle between them, but it's the same vector. That angle is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So we can define the angular momentum this way, which if there are multiple components, again, not, well, I should be careful. Not components as in vectors, but if the velocity vector has multiple components, right? This, this is one half m v x squared plus v y squared plus v z squared, etc. Which is an energy associated with an object that has some mass and it is moving. You know, the energy associated with its motion, which again is kind of the energy usually of interest. So one can ask, can we come up with an expression for how kinetic energy changes? And then can I then, is it possible that I can come up with something that allows me to say whether or not this quantity is conserved? With momentum and angular momentum, there are things you can do um, to assure that the bulk change in momentum or the bulk change in angular momentum is a constant. We can't quite do that in terms of a conservation law for kinetic energy alone, but we can, if we you know, make the right definitions, come up with something that we now call conservation of energy. To get there, we then define this thing called work. So work is a quantity that is motivated by how kinetic energy changes. And since kinetic energy is a scalar, it has no direction associated with it, but it does have a velocity, right? That's the magnitude of the velocity squared. Work then is something that's associated with studying how objects speed up or slow down. All right, so work is a quantity motivated by trying to understand how objects speed up or slow down. 
And so we could think back to kinematics. When does an optic speed up or slow down or change direction? So if I just go off for a little kinematics review, I suppose I have an object who has some velocity that's moving to the right. And it's experiencing a force, or rather, it's undergoing some sort of acceleration. And suppose the acceleration is pointing in this direction. Suppose that's A. Well then, A being a vector, there is a component of A that is parallel to V. I might call that A parallel. That seems to point to the right. And then there is a component of A that is perpendicular to V. Now if I think of just which one of these is going to associate, you know, change the object's speed, I'm going down the road this way and I you know, pump the accelerator, the engine then tries to push my car further in that direction, the direction my wheels are, are turned. So it is the parallel component that is associated with speeding up or slowing down. So in this particular example, it would speed up. But then there's the perpendicular component that deals with direction. This object will continue to go to the right, but will then also start to veer downward you know, based on this drawing. So in this case, you know, if I, can, if I define this angle between them as theta, it becomes clear that when the acceleration is closer to being parallel to the velocity, the object is going to speed up. When the, when the acceleration is closer to being anti-parallel, the object might slow down and then eventually come to rest, turn around, and then start speeding up in the other direction because then A and V would become parallel, assuming A doesn't change. And then in the case where A is perpendicular, uh, that changes the direction. And if it's something where the direction is always perpendicular, is my ball on the screen. Right. If the, if the thing is moving to the right and there's an acceleration downward, right, the thing is then going to kind of veer downward. But if the acceleration vector always changes so that it is perpendicular to the velocity, so that when this thing moves a little bit downward, then the acceleration vector changes with it, and of course then you get circular motion, which in this case the acceleration vector is always pointed towards the center of the circle which is always perpendicular to something that's sweeping out a circle like that. So, if we just try to summarize here, uh, when theta is less than 90 degrees, um, the object speeds up, this theta being the angle between V and A. And when it's greater than 90 degrees, it slows down. When it's equal to 90 degrees, there's no change in speed. And then notice if you think of the dot product, which has that cosine factor, Cosine is positive when it's when the angle is less than 90 degrees. It is negative when it's greater than 90 degrees. And it is uh, zero when it's equal to 90 degrees. And the dot product is only defined between zero and 180. So that's all we need to worry about. So then this then motivates the definition of work. as it seems, it must be related to some sort of change in kinetic energy. So we define a little bit of work. We define that to be, and again, let's think of now, let's try this back to forces. If I have a force that's pointing towards the right and I'm moving to the right, well then by Newton's law, there's an acceleration to the right, I'm gonna speed up. The force I'm feeling is perpendicular. The acceleration I feel is perpendicular, I'm gonna just change direction. And then if it's anti-parallel, I might slow down. So there seems to be a relationship between the force, which is vector, and the direction I'm going, which 
you know, you could associate with velocity, but we could just think of the numerator of velocity, right? It's a change in distance over a change in time, right? It's the displacement that matters. It doesn't matter how long it takes me to get from, you know, between two points, but it's a force, and then I move a little bit in some direction. So we can define it as the dot product of force times dr, right? You're some little displacement. A little bit of work is defined to be uh, force over some distance. It forces applied over distances. Again, there's the definition of work. And by the nature of the dot product, since the dot product has that cosine factor, and I'll just write it out explicitly, right? F dot dr is defined to be the magnitude of F times cosine times the magnitude of dr. And this F cosine is the part of F that is parallel to the displacement. It extracts, and if we just draw the triangle, this is F, there's some displacement here, dr, some angle between them, theta. There is a component of F that is parallel to the displacement, namely this side of the triangle, which by Sokotoa is just F cosine theta. So the dot product yanks out that parallel part, which again, seems meaningful for kinetic energy because that's the part that's going to determine if I speed up or slow down. And so then again, it'd be interested to look at bulk changes uh, rather than having to deal with a bunch of infinitesimal little moments. So, over there. So again, I could first try to write this in a more sophisticated way. So work is f dot dr, excuse me, by Newton's law, force is just ma, but I know that the acceleration is the derivative of velocity, and since I'm interested in, you know, changing speeds, uh, I might be motivated to write everything in terms of velocities, perhaps. Then again, I'll be a sloppy physicist and treat the derivative like a fraction, and I'm going to move the. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, down wrong. I skipped ahead. Dr. I'm going to be sloppy and kind of move that dt over to the dr. So then this is m db dot dr over dt. So then dr over dt is the definition of velocity. And this is m dv dot v. And since the dot product commutes, I'll write this as mv dot dv. So this is, hang on, this, this is just math so far. But where it gets useful, again, in thinking about definitions, typically intro physics textbooks kind of in, you know, define kinetic energy to be 1 half mv squared. Here I've tried to motivate a definition of work, and then from that, that might motivate why I should call kinetic energy one half mv squared. You might ask, I surely did, you know, like why the one half? You know, um, it's just a number. Um, here's why. Again, the idea is I want to look at the net. You know, I want to do, I want to apply forces over distances, perhaps over long distances. I also want to integrate this equation. Right? I want to integrate dw. And then that means I'm going to have to integrate whatever I get at the other end of all these equal signs. This thing on the right, let's just go off and do a little thing on the, si on the side. It's, I think it's easier to think of this in terms of derivatives versus integrals. Let's imagine you wanted to do something like take the time derivative of this quantity that I'll write down call 1 half m v dot v. I wanted to take the time derivative of that expression. Well, the mass is a constant, right? We're now, at this point, I assume we've done derivatives, whoever's you know, in the calc sequence. You know, 
this essentially is just um, a product rule. I essentially have two terms, uh, or rather, I have two. I, yeah, I have two factors rather, the two velocity vectors. And the fact that they're, that they're derivatives um, in a Calc three course, you'll show that the usual product rules and whatnot still apply in these cases. So this is one half m d by dt of f, sorry, v dot v, which then becomes one half m, then product rule. Derivative of velocity is acceleration, so this looks like acceleration dot v, then plus v dot acceleration. But since the dot product commutes, a dot v is the same thing as v dot a, so this looks like it's just m v dot a, which again I will write instead as a, uh, I'll go back to just writing it as the derivative of uh, dv dt. Parentheses, poorly sized. As this one. Maybe it's just, since rather than just doing it as an aside, I'm going to just make, give it its own line. And then I'm going to once again be a sloppy physicist and notice that there's a dt on both sides of this expression in the denominator, so I'm going to multiply both sides by dt and cancel those out. So then it looks like uh, so then I multiply by dt, and then that becomes d of this quantity equals m v dot dv. And notice, this is the same thing as that. Essentially, so then up here above, you know, and you know, in our kind of original equation, I can write this, let's go down the line, you know, I can write this as being equal, this is the same thing as d of this quantity one half m v dot v. So ultimately, I have shown that a little bit of change, in, a little bit of work is the same thing as a little bit of change in this quantity. Because again, calculus, like this scene, right? You've seen something like this, right? If it was dx, you wouldn't freak out about this. But this might seem odd, uh, where it's d, some big old expression. But again, this just means a little bit, you know, a little bit of work result or a little bit of change, you know, you know, a little bit of work or a little change in w uh, results in a little bit of change in this quantity. And so, this ultimately then allows me to say that dw equals d, this expression. And then again, I want to integrate both sides now. From some start to some end. And again, if that left-hand side, I don't think anyone will panic, right? We would just call that the, you know, the net work, right? Net or work final minus uh, work initial, or I might just say W net, work net. Um, right, to stick with the kind of physics uh, notation. And then the right-hand side is exactly the same, right? It's, you know, if it was dx, we would call that kind of delta x. dy, we'd call it delta y. dt, we'd call it delta t. Um, d, bluff, right, this big old mess, then just becomes delta, bluff. So rather than writing bluff, which I don't know how to spell, if we define one half m v dot v, which again is the same thing as one half m v squared, has this thing called kinetic energy, so just call it Ke, then the right hand integral just becomes delta Ke.
So we've defined kinetic energy as a result of my, our, my definition from work. And this is the work energy theorem. And it wasn't until I was taking my GRE, which is kind of the, the SAT you take to get into grad school, but the, um, the GRE also has subject tests that are particular to your major. So I also had to take, you know, uh, essentially a two hour test on the entire physics major. And I can't tell you how many questions were on that, on that exam related to the work energy theorem. And it was only then, you know, senior year of college, that I made, there was like this moment of insight that I wanted to like stand up in the auditorium and scream, where I realized this thing really is the important bit. Right? We talk all about these things like energy and conservation, potential energy and all that stuff, but it all really originates from this expression. Work changes kinetic energy. We again have, have an expression of how does kinetic energy change? It changes when work is done. We define work to be forces over displacements. From there, I can define things like potential energy and conservations and blah, blah, blah. But it all starts here. So work energy theorem. Uh, it really should be bold and italicized, perhaps more in books uh, than it is in terms of fundamental ideas. But again, work changes kinetic energy. Um, or if I want to write this kind of as an integral, I can say the change in kinetic energy is a result of network, which again we define to be kind of force over distances from some start to end. And if the force is a constant, constant vector, then this just becomes F dot delta R. Essentially the F can come out, and it's an integral over dr, which again we would just replace with delta R. That tells you how kinetic energy changes. And again, we can do sanity checks, as we always should. You know, a delta kinetic energy, if there's if the thing speeds up, the kinetic energy has increased. When does the kinetic energy increase when I look at this integral? Well, this thing will be positive if this thing is positive. So that means the kind of integrand itself has to be overall a net has had a you know, net positive. You know, there's more area above, you know, under the curve that's above zero than you know, below zero. Well, let's just use the case of where f is constant, right? So this thing gets bigger when this thing is positive. When is this thing positive? The dot product is positive when this vector and this vector are closer to being parallel to one another. Is in the dot product that cosine, which is where this, you know, the positive or negative or zero really appears, um, the cosine is going to be positive. So, sanity checks. That all, that all works out. It is from here that we can then talk about conservative forces. Forces where I can define this thing called potential energy, and there are some nice uh, relationships like conservation of energy. Something we think is kind of generally true, you know, regardless of whether you have conservative forces or not. Um, again, but it's just saying that energy is this quantity that's passed into multiple different forms, and as long as you take account of all of them, you get conservation of energy. Then, right, this conservation of mechanical energy um, kind of focuses on when you're just dealing with conservative forces. Because uh, then you can write down mathematical expressions for how much energy. So essentially there are three properties. In an upper level uh, mechanics course, there are three properties that you will talk about for conservative forces. We probably talked about these a little bit, or at least some of these a little bit, in Physics 1. Right, they have essentially three equivalent properties. Equivalent in that if you assume any of these, if you assume if you assume only one of these, you can actually prove the other two, and it doesn't matter which you assume and which you prove. So this is a equivalence relationship between these three things. If a force is a conservative force, it has the property that the network is zero 
for any closed path. So if I have some force field, and let's just use a constant force, the constant force field of gravity to anchor ourselves. We can imagine drawing other force fields. That says if I start, say, at the origin, and then I have some object that moves maybe in this direction, and moves over here, and maybe goes down here, and then moves all the way back here. Those are that's a path that's kind of broken into four segments, right? The diagonal up, the horizontal up, the vertical down, and then the horizontal left at the bottom. Uh, since it is a path, I'll draw little arrows to specify. Right? If I were to evaluate the work done along that path, uh, it would be zero, since gravity is a conservative force. Kind of the, the positive work you gain in some locations uh, is exactly canceled out by the work, the negative work that's done in other locations. And so, again, a fancier way to do that, write that if I wanted to say that, is f dot dr, and again, we can use this symbol here which just means it's a closed, but then it's dr path, rather than a closed surface, like we talked about for Gauss's law. Um, and this, yeah, line integrals, that's a Calc 3 thing, you know, where you have to do these in general, we'll likely only stick with 1D, uh, but you could evaluate the work that's being done in these cases, and it would be zero since work is just integral of f dot dr. So again, essentially that's saying kind of if you, you know, think gravity, if I throw this up and it comes back down, it starts with some kinetic energy, but then that kinetic energy goes away, eventually comes to rest, then it goes to gain kinetic energy back as it falls. And then you can calculate exactly what it lost, it got back. And then it can also be done, you know, in you know, more complex directions. Uh, two, second property, which is the important property for us, is that there is a scalar function we'll use u there's a scalar function u um, called the potential energy defined such that, and we define it to be uh, that the work, the work done by a conservative force between two points So it moves from point A to point B, which might be the same point, right? It might be a path that where it ends up back where it started, but it doesn't have to necessarily end up back where it started. Um, so if the work done by conservative force between two points relates to this function U by the following, that the work done is equal to negative delta U. That the work done is equal to negative of u final minus u start. I guess I was using start and end before, so let me be consistent. Get rid of that final, right end. And you could distribute the negative if you want, but again, if there's an end and a start, my mind wants it to be end minus start, so I'll keep that negative up front. Let's see. Um, I want to only be highlighting things in this lecture that are generally true. So the work energy theorem is important. That deserves a highlight. This expression here, um, I think is also worth a highlight because that is in a sense the definition of potential energy. Changes in potential energy relate to work. So again, what does this say? 
changes in this quantity called potential energy relate to work. Or I would say work done by the force. So again, if, if work, again, we want to have a conceptual idea, you know, if work is talking about how forces make an object speed up or slow down, we're relating these changes in potential energy to how much work has been done. Um, which then, of course, relates to kinetic energy. Work, work, the network is then equal to the kinetic energy, the change in kinetic energy. So there are two things to point out. So note here, it's delta U. Work, which is force over distance, right? There's physical quantities there. Forces being pushed over exact distances. Those are two physical quantities. Work is a physical quantity, in a sense. Um, but then it's delta U. Uh, it's a change in potential energy. Notice I didn't write U equals W. It's de delta U. So this implies something that's important, that only delta U, the change in potential energy, has any physical meaning. If I tell you that the potential energy of a ball is 10 joules, that doesn't really, that technically does not tell me anything um, unless you provide me some additional information. Uh, if you tell me that when you drop the ball, it went, the potential energy went from having 10 joules to zero joules of potential energy, there, regardless of any other assumptions, I can, I can say something, right? If the delta U went from 10 to zero, that means, you know, so 0 minus 10 is negative 10, throw an, an additional negative sign because of this definition. That means the work done by whatever force was acting on it that had this potential energy function was equal to 10 joules, positive 10 joules. The work is positive, the thing speeds up as a result of the work that was done by that particular force. When you tell me it went from having 10 joules to 0 joules of potential energy. And this goes back to the other videos you watch, you know, where I kind of made an analogy of like cash in a bank. You know, if you cash out your savings, your, your, your savings account decreases as a result of your personal kind of money you have on hand, which I was calling kinetic energy increases. Uh, a decrease in your potential energy usually you know, results in you increasing your kinetic energy. So if delta U goes down, negative delta U is positive, Positive work, speed up. But only changes have physical meaning. And then the question is, why the negative? Let me get back to that. The negative essentially here, let me just write, the negative is simply definition and done for convenience. For us to write something down like conservation of energy this negative sign will make our lives a lot saner. Then there's property three, which is called, which I call it the test. Or just how you can test to see whether or not a force is a conservative force or not. Which then means if it is, you can define this thing called potential energy. This you, you won't do until Calc 3 or upper level analytical mechanics, is that a force um, such that the curl is zero. What the heck is curl? It's this thing called, you know, nabla, it's upside down triangle. Um, and then it's the cross product with the force F. So that thing is called the curl, uh, and again, that's a, that's a calc 3 thing, don't worry about it now. Um, but there is some mathematical operation you can do with the force to determine if uh, the force is a conservative force or not. Um, and it's often the kind of easiest way to show if a force is conservative. So, we'll say calc 3. So, given these, if 
if you only have conservative forces. acting on the system. And for, this, for the sake of example, I'll just use one. I'll just assume there's one force, but if there's multiple forces, then you just kind of add them all up. So in the case where there's only one force acting on the system, um, the change in kinetic energy, of course, is equal to the, the net work done. That's just the work energy theorem. But now let's connect uh, step two, or, or property two. If that work is being done by a conservative force, like say gravity, then we know I can also define this potential energy you know, that connects to work. Then I know I can also write this thing on the right hand side as negative delta u by definition. And by definition, we threw in the negative sign so that if I were to move it to the other side, this looks like it's saying delta kinetic energy plus delta U equals zero, or that delta kinetic energy plus potential equals zero, which if we call that the total energy, says that the delta E total equals zero. which of course uh, then is conservation of energy, or conservation of mechanical energy, technically. Which of course then, if you can use conservation laws, how wonderful. Now, the only other thing I need to say before we kind of get into the actual content of this lecture, this is going to be a long lecture, uh, but we're going to spend multiple days in class on this lecture, is what is, in, what is the, you know, we have this potential energy function, and I've, at this point I've not said how to figure out what it is. Like when you say mgy for a constant gravitational field, you know, where is that coming from? Let's, again, take a step back and think conceptually. We have this force that we want to do something with that force, some mathematical thing that then allows us to uh, write down a scalar uh, that we call potential energy. So given some sort of force vector, there is something we want to be able to do that then uh, uh, lets us write, write it down instead as a potential energy function that's a scalar. But of course, I want to make this definition such that I'm not losing information along the way. You might think of vector, right? Vector has magnitude and direction. But a scalar, u, it's a function, so I might be able to plug in numbers and get numbers, but it's not going to give me a direction. It is just a scalar. So I want to make sure whatever I'm doing uh, and it turns out this is there's going to be uh, an integral that gets us here. I want to be able to, you know, given the potential energy function, I want to be able to somehow get back f with no loss of information. Else, it might seem that there's there would be then some benefit over using one over the other, uh, just in terms of the amount of information you have. And perhaps unsurprisingly, there's going to be some sort of derivative involved uh, in doing this. Such that combining calculus with these definitions, we actually can state some sort of equivalence between the vector force and the potential energy scalar function. And it all comes from this definition of, uh, so using that, we said that delta u uh, was equal to negative the work done by the force. Oops, equal to negative work done by the force. That then is, of course, the right-hand side is equal to negative the integral of force over distance dot product from some start to end point. 
And so then the left hand side, you would write as u end minus u start equals delta u, which is the same thing as negative the work, which is then equal to negative this integral. Well, all of these kind of works over distances. Now, since it's only changes in delta u that matter, it's only when the potential energy changes and I say what's the end minus the initial at the start. That only has any physical meaning. So, you, so by that alone, it can make sense that there is some arbitrariness to the exact values it has. If I say a ball has 10 joules when it's here above the table, and then you say actually it has 50 joules, you know, it's very it's quite possible that we are both being consistent with one another depending on how we define where zero is. Because again, when it falls to the ground, it's only the change that matters. So if I say it goes from 10 and then it ends up at negative 10, a change of 20, that says the same thing if you say it starts at 50 and ends up at 30. Both of them is a change of 20 downward. So there's a little bit of freedom um, in that there's what essentially is like, not exactly true, but kind of like a constant of integration sort of thing. This comes to that uh, we define, okay, if, we want to, if we want to then be able to state unambigu unambiguously how to, how to assign a value at each point in space to the potential energy, we define u equals zero at a reference point. And it's just the place where you have decided that's where u equals zero. Your friend could define a different spot and they would do some mathematical operation and they get a different potential energy function, but nonetheless they would agree when you're dealing with changes. So, um, so then, in a, then you can define the potential energy function as, essentially we just take this expression up here, but then we let the start point be the reference point. So I will write this down as kind of u end minus u uh, ref equals negative the integral from the reference point to, I guess, the end of f dot tr. Now, by definition, we said that u is 0 at the reference point. So then, that means this equals 0 by definition. And therefore, we can write down u at some point is equal to negative the integral from the reference point to your kind of point of interest, like what we were doing with the electric field of f dot dr. So this is some arbitrary point, some point of interest. If it's got to be a function of x, and you define x equals 0 to be the reference point, then this would be an integral from 0 to x. Here, let's just quickly do it for gravity. Because then it's also useful for me to define uh, some expressions. Uh, so actually that's worth highlight as well. So then, for example, this is due gravity and a, const a constant gravitational field. So at the, in this case, the force due to gravity, I'm going to define up as positive, as you can see by my coordinate axis. Then the force due to gravity is then negative mg in the y direction. You know, so I have an object of mass m, and it feels a gravitational acceleration from the Earth, and it pulls it downward. I'm going to write this actually as um, m times this vector g 
here because again I know essentially in that G I'm lumping in uh, the gravitational acceleration part the mass I'm keeping separate because it's the mass you know if it's a mass of a ping pong ball versus a bowling ball I plug in different masses but they both are experiencing the same gravitational acceleration so that G is independent of the mass of the object you know that's moving because of gravity why I'm doing this will become clearer in a little bit but um, if we want to actually evaluate, say, the potential energy, I have to pick a reference point. So if I pick y equals zero as the ref, as the reference point, I can then write down that the potential energy due to gravity is, first I'll start with definitions, the integral of the gravitational force dot dr. And then I'm going to start at my reference point, which I'm going to call y equals zero, and then go out to some arbitrary point y. Technically, we also have to motivate that this is a one-dimensional uh, or that this function is going to be one dimensional, but since we know the answer. So then this looks like it's negative, the integral from, then I can actually do this dot product. Negative mg dot y, uh, this looks like it's mg, because it's the magnitude, uh, times dr, so the magnitude of those two vectors, times the cosine of the angle between them. Uh, so in this case, gravity is pointing down, and if I'm going from zero to y, I'm kind of moving. I'm starting at the reference point, and then I'm going up to y. So then it looks like the kind of path I'm taking, going from zero to y, is in the opposite direction as uh, uh, the force. So then the cosine pops out to negative one. So again, this is kind of f. This is dr, and then this is cosine. So then this looks like it's just the negatives cancel. This looks like it's an integral from, oh, sorry, it's not dr, right? It's dy in this case. Because my path is entirely along the y direction. That dr really is just dy. I'm moving in the y direction. So then this looks like it's mg dy. I'm going from y equals 0 to y equals some arbitrary point y. So then, unsurprisingly, it looks like this is an m. G, Y. And again, define your reference point to be something zero or non-zero. Like maybe I want this table to be the zero point. Uh, so I then might plug in Y equals one meter and then integrate out to Y. We won't have to do that you know, too much or I will just do it in, in lecture. But again, it's good to see these things so that when you see it in an upper level context, it's not completely new. So here's the case where it looks like I went from F, I did something, and then I got U. And then we did that by doing, I guess technically, uh, this integral. Now I might want to go the other way. I want to start with U and get back F. Well here we can rely on the conceptual idea that the derivative and the, and the integral are anti, or as inverses of one another. I can get, I can cancel them out um, Essentially, the, one of the fundamental themes of calculus is saying this, that you know, the derivative and the integral are inverses of one another. So let me just state uh, without proof. I'm going to need more room than this. Right, actually, that'd be good. So then given some scalar function u, you get back f by doing what? So off here to the side, we defined u to be negative, the integral of work. So you can imagine, if you, I want to cancel out that derivative, you know, just like if I have sine and then I take the inverse sine of it, right, I think I can cancel out. If I take the ex exponential of a logarithm or the log of an exponential, then they cancel each other out. You might imagine I can do that by taking the derivative of both sides. 
and you know, but you know, but you might think, well, that right hand side is the integral of a path integral. Um, so, if you understand that conceptual idea, great. Uh, that's all we'll need. That for one D, it's defined as the force, uh, which I'll write as a vector. Though again, if it's one D, you don't really need to write it as a vector, but forces are vectors as negative du dx. And again, staring at this, maybe that's not too hard to you know, rationalize. If, there, if it's a 1D integral, that right hand side, that integral on the right hand side is gonna be f dot dx, right? It's an integral over x. So if you wanna cancel out an integral over x, it might make sense that you then have to take a derivative with respect to x. So if I take the derivative with respect to x on both sides and then move the negative sign over. That gets you the 1D expression. In multi-D, I don't know if you would have done this in physics one, but why not? The force then is defined as negative, and there's this upside down triangle again, uh, times U. And negative and nabla U or, or uh, inverse delta U is called uh, the gradient. where I, again, I'm taking a scalar function u, I'm doing something to it, and it turns back into a vector. And then Cartesian coordinates, and it's actually pretty simple to write down. That delta u is, I essentially just take the partial derivative of u with respect to every variable I have. Because the thing might be multi-dimensional, right? It might depend on x and y and z. So you have to take a partial derivative. Which again, remember, I forget when these are taught. But a partial derivative, you, you know, if I take the partial derivative with respect to x, I just pretend that y and z are constants uh, and then do the derivative like I would in Calc 1. If I want to take the partial with respect to y, I pretend x and z are constants and take the derivative as I would in Calc 1 with respect to y. Yeah, so again, if u equals 3xy squared, the partial derivative with respect to x, I pretend x, x is a variable, y is a constant, so 3y squared is a constant. Then I take the derivative with respect to x, it just becomes 3y squared. The partial derivative with respect to y, I take the three and the x, and I print the three and the x are constant, but then take the derivative of y squared. Derivative of y squared is just two y, so then this is six x y. Then I throw a negative sign in front of everything, and then that is the force. I've then taken a scalar function and turned it back into a force. It's the fact you can do this, like, it might not seem that impressive now, but like, it's actually pretty cool that you can, you know, enc encode in this one scalar function, multi-dimensional information, within that one scalar, not a, not a vector function, you have information that as long as you do the right mathematical techniques, you turn it into a vector, right? That gives you, you know, perhaps multi-dimensional information, which is pretty cool. Uh, this is worth a highlight as well. Uh, now, you know, how you get the potential energy from for the force, and now how you get the force from the potential energy. All right. That was just the prelude. Oh, my dear. All right, this is going to be a huge lecture. I'm going to stop the video now because it takes a long time to export these things. So there might be multiple videos associated with uh, the lecture you have to watch. Uh, so check the modules.